And I see everybody's here. We have representation from the north and from the south. My name is Sarah Burns. I'm an educational audiologist working for the Lovedence province-wide support team. I just want to take a couple of moments to speak to you about some things that are coming up this school year. So you all have a heads up about our plans. And I said you all, so I'm sorry about that. Um, each having one of these kind of meetings where we have a professional learning group, except for in October. In, on, in October, we're planning uh, a face-to-face -face, uh, meeting in Edmonton and in uh, Airdrie, actually. I thought it was in Calgary, but it's in Airdrie. Um, October 31st is, the, is occurring in Airdrie, and November 1st is in Edmonton. And the reason we picked those dates Sorry, first is a We pick those dates because it's kind of around Halloween and we know it's in schools on Halloween. We'll receive an invitation today with an RSP. Please respond to that so we can plan the number of people coming. All PLCs, the Professional Learning Community, November 21st, it's a Monday afternoon, we're going to have the Central Institute for the Deaf speaking about the rationale for auditory training and some overviews of their product called um, the Spice Kits. On just another Monday, um, Adrian Whitall, who's a neurologist with Kids for Cancer Society at the Scholarly, will be speaking about kids who have survived cancer and their education. Education, their specific educational needs. Um, not about hearing loss, I believe, but may about their academic um, uh, following the treatment of cancer. I will be inviting their Chelsea's vision and communication needs to that as well. So, Six, Lynn McQuarrie, the director of the Western Canadian Center for Deaf Studies and professor of the U of A, will be speaking about the work at the WCCDF and give a brief overview of recent research projects at the center. Working on the rest of the PLs and would also appreciate suggestions from any of you. Jameson, a teacher of the deaf at the Teacher of the Deaf Training Program at UBC, we'll be doing um, a full day workshops in four locations around the province. It'll be on the topic of enhancing uh, deaf and hard of hearing students' interactions, interactions, as well as increasing parent engagement in um, children's education and language acquisition. Wow, I'm seeing a lot of things here. But one of the other things I want to tell you about is um, Ray um, McCombs, my supervisor here at the Low Endings team, will be sending out uh, some information about some financial assistance for skills development in the RCSD area. And there will be an application form on that. Now, not least, our speakers today. First of all, we're going to have Beth Hansen with the LASHI program at the Glen Rose provide uh, information about the LASHI program at the Glen Rose and services that they provide for families with children who are deaf and hard of hearing. And then after that, I will be introducing Joe Redhead with the Connect Society. So Beth has her PowerPoint up for Alberta Health Services, and Beth is going to send over the mic. I should do that because I have no idea where the point is right now. And we can begin your your talk. Thank you. You there? That's done. You, we can now hear you. And I'm going to mute mine. And if you need something, Bev, you just let us know, okay? Okay. All right. Thank you. Actually, thanks so much to Ross because uh, 
joining this meeting um, has been as difficult as uh, what we do on a daily basis here, but I'm here. Um, I am presenting, I think, because uh, Ryan Pernitsky um, had a meeting and had some information about Washi, and someone was commenting on the the range of children that we see, and um, it's not very accurate, so I had just contacted Sarah, just hoping she would send us some information, but of course, she let me speak, rather, and so, yeah. um, I have been at the Glen Rose for about 17 years and most of that time in the Lashie program. And it's changed a little bit over the years, but uh, for the most part, um, we see the same kinds of kids and we have the same kinds of um, professionals involved in our program. I'm trying to advance my slide. Um, so just in creating the PowerPoint, I tried to address some of the questions that Sarah sent. So I think our for vision, I just uh, uh, is in our brochure, and it's, I guess, kind of globally what we have in mind for our program, and that's just to give overall quality of life for children with hearing loss and give them hopefully impart skills that help them to be really active participants with their families and in their communities. Um, we have some goals, uh, so I just try to select kind of a broad range of things that, that we focus on in the program. Um, one of our primary goals, it is primarily a spoken language, listening and spoken language program. Of course, then we see are very diverse and we are trying to address diverse needs and so um, we do sign language. It is a tool. It's a bridge for many kids. It's a it's an outcome for many kids. It's a primary mode of communication for some of the kids we see. But um, prior to our listening and spoken language program, um, and our one of our primary objectives is just empowering parents so that they are fully participating in therapy, really equal parts in the intervention. So. Um, where after their um, hour or their group uh, with us, they really are living the same kinds of skills and strategies throughout their day. Uh, and that's probably the foundation of our program, that it is a very parent-family-focused program, and they, they are really here as often as their children are. Um, encouraging um, environments that really promote uh, language development, um, helping parents understand what those environments are like. Um, we do talk about brain development, auditory cortex development with our families, and um, we speak about auditory living. So the strategies they're using, as I said before, kind of through their day, all day. And um, we're very um, interested in promoting constant use of hearing aids and cochlear implants. So we're always targeting all hours. Um, so we're working very closely with audiology to try to achieve that, making sure that we understand the kind of access to sound our, our children are getting and um, knowing that that's uh, something that they can have in place throughout their waking hours. Um, on kind of a light note, we do try to provide opportunities for children to just be together with other children that are hearing impaired that are of similar ages. And, um, um, some of our program, that's, that's not such a, a deal when you live in a big center like Edmonton, but many of our patients are from other communities, and sometimes they're the only child. I'm sure most of you know that, uh, that same experience. They're the only child in their school or in their community that has a hearing loss. Um, the major goal for us is just making sure that we're kind of going diagnostic intervention, assessing development, to help us really, um, guide treatment, make good decisions for kids, and to measure the outcomes that we're achieving. And then finally, uh, a big program is support kids when they enter um, more of the education system. So we're talking with our population, primarily preschool, and just um, really out there and similar to the work that you're doing, 
uh, with maybe a little bit older kids, just helping them to use skills that they're learning at home and in small groups and individual therapy here um, to incorporate those skills into the classroom. As about who's on our staff, um, this is basically what we're made of, speech language pathologists and teachers of the deaf and hard of hearing. Um, I'm listening as a spoken language specialist. We do have an auditory verbal therapist, Catherine. Most people know Catherine. She is retired. Although she she still is around a lot and um, is a casual employee, but she's not actually on a daily basis. Um, audiologists are a huge part of our program. We work really closely with audiology, social worker, um, psychologist, consulting physician, and um, we do all here at the Glen Rose, so consulting, OT, PT, those kinds of things are accessible, although um, they're not frequently involved in the program. And of course, speech pathology assistance. Uh, what we are doing, because we see children from infancy, and primarily the kids we see are infants to um, through kindergarten age, and um, these are kind of services we talk about with them, and it varies depending on the child's age. Um, peer support, obviously. Um, um, intervention for infants that's typically in their home. Um, assessment, treatment, consultation. Um, most of the therapy, a lot of the therapy we do is individual uh, sessions. Um, when they get a little bit older, we move to group treatment. Um, our, every on the team, all the speech pathologists and teachers of the deaf are also part of the cochlear implant team. And our role there is, um, it is but it's primarily assessment and counseling around cochlear implant candidacy. Uh, one of the things we talked about previously is just providing support to the community and particularly um, early in programs and, and to support. So when a child is moving from our program to, um, to the education program or from early intervention to early education, we just try to help with that transition. So previously mentioned, I'm just kind of going to go through um, what we do with children at different ages. Again, our primary population is infants to have completed kindergarten. So that, that's the age range that we're typically working with. Um, infants, we often seeing them um, primarily um, often one, two times per month. Sometimes the frequency is, is uh, more frequent than that. Uh, often it's weak for a short period of time if there's a particular uh, goal we're trying to achieve. For example, children not wearing the equipment and a, and a parent really struggling with that. Um, and of course, we invite our to people's homes, but everybody wants that. So there are families that choose to come into the Glen Rose even with their babies. Um, it's the ideal environment to see a baby, but um, sometimes families do prefer that. Um, when children um, around the age of two, we encourage them to start uh, coming to the Glen Rose. Um, we start a toddler group. It's a parent toddler group, and parents are actually in, in the program with the clinics with the toddlers. And typically, those are once a week. And in addition to that group session, um, children are attending an individual session with their parents or a significant other. It's not feasible for a parent to come on time, and we just try to be kind of flexible about it. It's a grandparent, it's a caregiver, it's a, um, a day home lady, whatever um, suits the family's needs, we just try to uh, have a significant other there to, to, to um, carry over at home. Three-year-olds, we're um, increasing the amount of time that we see them. Group tippy runs two times a week. Parents are no longer in the session, are run by speech pathologists or teachers of the deaf and hard of hearing, and um, parent serving. And individual sessions remain the same. 
um, typically a parent that's attending an individual session with the speech pathologist or teacher. Um, and then for our four-year-olds, one more day a week of group. So those are offered three times a week and an individual session in addition to that. Um, we have children that are able to come three times a week. So they are, you know, they're flexible about that. If they can only come once a week, um, that's what we try to work with. Uh, five years, these, this is our kindergarten group. Um, and the ages vary a little bit. So we sometimes have five-year-olds in our four-year-old group, and it's really based more on development than age. Um, but the kindergarten group, one day a week, and those children are continuing in their individual therapy sessions. And of course, uh, all of that is um, kind of tied to what their need is. So there are some children that are um, attending the kindergarten group and the speech pathologist at school is seeing them. Their needs are not so great that uh, we need to continue with an individual session here. So um, that our, our um, frequency or intensity varies depending on the child's need and what other services are appropriate. The most of our children, so when we're kind of talking about transitioning from early intervention to early education, um, three to five-year-old kids are a 10 group here and typically attending an early education program or a kindergarten program. And those absolutely vary depending on what a parent has chosen. Um, many of our kids are in Edmonton Public or Edmonton Catholic early education classes. Some of them are in um, private play schools or private preschools, and those um, programs are using PUF to support the children. And um, what typically happens is a child will be uh, going to an education program. Today. So if it's morning, they're attending group here in the afternoon. Their individual sessions are in the afternoon or versa. And uh, we work very collaboratively so um, we go out to those settings and just to support the school um, and the staff however they need. Uh, we have a lots of um, education programs that have had many of our kids and so um, the support is there's this need and we're going less frequently um, but if there are some schools that are having their first hearing impaired child uh, or just a very different child than they previously had. So we try to go out um, throughout the school year periodically. And definitely staff is always welcome to come to programming at the Glen Road to watch or participate or plan with us, um, as well as the individual sessions. We just try to encourage um, an open door. So if people want to come, they're welcome to do so. so. There was a question about uh, rural services and um, children that are coming from homes with English as a second language. So I just kind of did a quick survey uh, of our caseload. Um, these are very gross numbers, but um, I was looking at the children enrolled in the preschool class that we're running during the school year, and there are 65% of them are from uh, homes that are not the first language. And Sometimes English is not the first language, but they're primarily using English with their own, um, but many homes, they're not using English primarily. Uh, so we are definitely a major factor, and that number, that percentage is increasing every year. Um, I also looked at just our, our rural population, and it was, again, yeah, just a, a look at the, our most um, common age group, the zero to six years, and uh, rough count was about 43 of those children are from outside of Edmonton. So um, a major part of our caseload, and uh, we do have to find ways to serve those families. And, um, and working with this population knows that there's a very high percentage of children with additional difficulties. I didn't uh, scrutinize our caseload. What numbers actually are, but the 30 to 40% seems 
fought on. We that number is definitely seems to be increasing all the time. Uh, we do a lot of um, work with the neonatal follow-up clinic at the Glen Rose, and many of those children have multiple. Question about how we serve our out-of-town families. I think um, you know you hit it on the head when you had it in brackets there. So it's health a lot to telehealth, um, and what we've started doing um, rather than I think you know what we used to do long ago is set up telehealth and a clinician, for example, or a school would have a child and we would watch and kind of consult. Um, over that session. And uh, we've definitely made a shift to uh, the community where the child is watching when the child comes in to work with us. I think we just get um, comfortable. Um, the patient is more open. Uh, we don't want anybody to feel like we're scrutinizing or, or um, supervising them. So uh, I, that's typically what I try to do. And most of the clinicians are trying to do the same thing. So telehealth is, is really um, helpful. Um, we do a lot of work on the phone, obviously. Um, a lot of town families do come into Edmonton frequently, and we definitely try to coordinate with those appointments. So if they're coming in for audiology or going to the Stollery or just a visit to Edmonton, um, we always try to book visits to the Glen Rose at those times. And just collaborate a lot with the speech pathologists in um, in our communities. Some families actually travel very regularly to Edmonton. Um, families from Lloydminster, St. Paul, a um, variety of places that actually make those long trips a um, couple times um, just to participate in. in if we uh, can do collaboratively with um, services in their community. We like to do that because we don't, you know, want families on the road, especially in the winter, if um, their needs can be met in their community. But some families really do appreciate coming in. There isn't much service where they're living. Um, the other thing we do is just um, offer workshops. So typically, um, those are primarily offered to schools that have a hearing impaired child and their teachers and um, assistants who may have not had a child in their classroom before with, with a hearing loss. And um, we started opening those up to speech pathologists and it, they've been quite well received. And then just being um, at the Glen Rose, we do get a lot of um, residents and um, students that we need to um, provide you know, information to. So previously, our, we we're following children right from diagnosis, so many of them are infants, and um, they're eligible for service kind of through their kindergarten year. And again, with early amplification and intervention, a lot of kids are not needing to be followed for that entire um, span. Um, and if they don't need service, we certainly don't want to um, have them come into the Glen Rose for, for therapy. Um, but that's our, our kind of our bread and butter. Those are the kids that we typically are serving. Um, the that we've been noticing a lot is um, families moving to Canada and being diagnosed with a hearing loss. Um, so ages of five and six, and, and they can be very, very significant hearing losses. And uh, I think Sarah, she's uh, called and, and asked about children that were, oh, Hold on, I think that was unfortunately my fault. Okay. We, 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 were, sorry, we were trying to scroll through something, and of course, okay. it's really fussy. And I think I'll give it a few seconds and I'll have you back as the. Uh, sorry. Okay. It's nice to talk to somebody. I'm sick of my voice. <laughs> Oops. Well, you're not the Connect Society. And next, so step back. Go back to the quick start and see if share screen is there. I can't try. Do I find that? Share screen. Oh. 
Oh, you, you may have to click on it again. Oh. There we go. I'm sorry about, you know what? We're going to touch anything on our end because it, it might cause uh, it's fussy. So we'll just not with the mouse and you can keep going. Sorry about that. Okay. No problem. Okay. Um, I'm almost done. Uh, so I, I was saying, so you, you've, you've uh, called me about kids that have, you know, they're in grade one, they've just been diagnosed. Um, so first, we're, we're very open to accepting those kids into the program if we can meet some need for them. So um, sometimes it's individual therapy with their parents, but sometimes it's just participating in a group and learning some strategies to the function in a classroom with hearing loss, some comprehension and monitor skills, um, and just having parents become really comfortable with the equipment and give them some knowledge about the impact of the hearing loss and what they can, uh, they can support their child at home. Um, we do follow children under 18 who receive cochlear implants. So there are families that, uh, or children that have had more hearing and then maybe at the age of eight or uh, 12, they, their hearing has deteriorated and they're getting a cochlear implant. And children, we do service for two, two years post-implantation. That's typically individual. It, it, we don't offer group services for those kids. And, uh, uh, again, it's based on, on need. Um, we do, just for fun, um, we do have a CI camp in the summer. It's an annual event and um, it runs the first week of July. And it is for school-aged children, and and many of the kids that attend that are from communities that uh, of Edmonton. Some from Edmonton come, and it's just a very uh, fun time. And they are with other kids with cochlear implants. They often, as I said before, don't see kids with cochlear implants, and and many of them come year after year and uh, have friendships um, develop. And when the kids get a little older, 13, 14, we just kind of turn them into leaders and they're um, just supporting the little kids in, in the group. And so there's quite an age span. We, those kids start coming um, or are able to start coming at the end of grade one and uh, can stay as long as they want, basically. Um, contacting us, I thought I would just include everybody's extension. I didn't actually... PowerPoint. I will send this to Sarah, though she can distribute it to those people that want it. But I just listed all the clinicians in the program. We're all the Glen Rose, and you're welcome to just call us about anybody. Um, and uh, you know, we really to work collaboratively, uh, especially with the kids that are in um, Centre other than Edmonton. I slide for the for the last question just about improving services, but uh, I think what's happening with this group is um, what we need, um, kind of a, uh, a group of people that are doing the same kind of work and sharing information. I would love to have just a contact list of names um, and locations where people are, and even a little bit of information about their, what they their kind of specialty is because um, that would be helpful just in terms of you know, having a difficult child or when you have a difficult child going into a community um, and being able to find the right um, information to support that child in another um, city other than Edmonton. Uh, and I, another I always think about is just re-involving parents because parents are such a big part of our program. We really see them every week. Um, and a, a criticism I know is just uh, the being in a different system, in the school system. And But I, sometimes parents are, well, they're often much less involved when their children move into um, school, especially um, elementary school, after early education programs. And and that would just be my hope that um, through this program, for example, they have uh, basically involved and they know so much and they're, 
they provide so much information to the school about their child, and um, I just like when, when um, consultants are going out and the family knows that they're going out and they know your name. And uh, it's interesting, we had a 30th birthday party for the CI program on Saturday, and we had a panel, and one of the parents speaking, uh, he was very eloquent, had lovely things to say, and started thanking people. And he was naming Krista Yuskow and, and Jackie and all kinds of people in addition to um, here. So I appreciate being involved, and um, that, that would be what I'd like to see kind of common practice throughout the province. I think I've addressed all the questions. I don't know if I've answered them all, but um, that's the end of my presentation. Seb, and um, great suggestions. I'll put the, about the names and locations, and um, I will put that forward to my supervisor because I have a list. Um, I'm hoping that I probably have to ask if I can share it. Uh, the other thing is Janet Jameson is going to be talking um, for half of her day about parent engagement. And um, I I know how important it is to have that buy-in. And if we have that buy-in, we don't have the wonderful things happen with our kids. So I appreciate all those comments and the great outline. Um, thank you so much. Um, the next person we're going to present is, uh, have present is Cheryl Redhead from Connect Society, and Connect Society is in Edmond and has recently, um, I guess last year, it was their first year, um, expanded into the Calgary area, um, and Cheryl Redhead has been teaching there for as long as I've been here, so <laughs> I've been an IC Game so. Are you available? Are you there? Okay. Feedback, Cheryl, like your microphone's trying to connect, but we're not getting actual. Okay. Yeah. So your mute switch? No. Are your muted. volume on? on oh. Back right now, Cheryl. Not actual, but like just like it. Like it's after we're trying to get some, but all we get is but there's all And it's not great sound. Better than you have now. You can try. So you do call my cell phone on your landline, and it's seven eight zero two three four one six one. Is this okay? I just want somebody to tell me whether you can hear this. So, can you start talking? Well, so what you would need to do is turn your because the reason is, is it's coming through your sound. It can um, just 
Uh, oh, your sound way down. So if you can turn your volume down there on your actual computer, Cheryl, because what's happening is it's coming through multiple times, right? Is it now? I think. Yeah. Can I ask, Brent, can you hear Cheryl speaking? I, yes, of course I do. I'm sorry about that. Um, We're just uh, with the group to see if people can hear you. What? Hi, this is Bryn. I can hear Carol coming through. Thank you. Okay. So, okay. Cheryl, do you have a screen or like something on your computer that you want to share? I do. It's working like advance one slide and back so I can make sure it's working. We are. So, Cheryl, because you have your um, your computer volume down, if something should happen to have a question or something, we might interrupt you. Absolutely. Sounds great. Okay, so um, I must apologize. I actually took Sarah's request quite literally. I have been planning on presenting on Connect Society's early intervention services. Um, I didn't include any of the preschool or kindergarten programming that we have. Um, although we are probably better known for our ECS programs, and thanks Sarah for mentioning that we've opened in Calgary as well. Uh, in rea reality, early intervention actually serves more families um, than both our Edmonton and Calgary sites combined. infant child development specialist. We have a thin language pathologist on staff. We also have a literacy coordinator who helps organize and run our family literacy grant. A sign language facilitator, a worker, and also a transition facilitator. In the journey, um, Next Society's early intervention program aligns with the International Joint Committee and hearing principles and guidelines for early intervention. Um, and I just want to talk a little bit about the family centered best practice. I think that Beth kind of touched on this a little bit in her in her uh, presentation. Or did 
developing partnerships um, with families that's based on mutual trust, respect, um, and open communication. We really need to be culturally appropriate and flexible, and also make sure that what we're doing is relevant and responsive to a family that might have their needs change over the course of time that we're working together. We recognize family as the ultimate decision maker, and we adopt practices that endorse a range of communication possibilities. Um, and support tends to reach decisions in ways that reflect the strength and their needs. Yes, um, we do have a policy that we will contact a family within 48 hours, and hopefully we're staying true to that. We do that families often have diagnosis are really struggling, and being family in that contact is very helpful. Uh, access, we, as Bev also mentioned, do you have home based uh, services as well as center based services? So, that, um, when that parent just wants to stay in their home or come here, they do have that access. Access is, um, we really like to keep up to date with the latest research, and we do have a close relationship with the Western Canadian Center of Deafness Studies that we very much value. And specialized knowledge and skills, deaf and hearing babies and toddlers, um, certainly understand complex needs. Um, in cultural populations, we do work quite closely with the multicultural health brokers. We, of course, have uh, expertise in American Sign Language and like to um, really work parents that parent to parent contact within our programs as well as um, opportunities. Interact with deaf mentors. But um, we provide home visits. I think often for parents, this preferred to meet in their home. They, they have a comfort there. It's the natural environment the child is learning in, and it's helpful for us. Because we can see and support parents to integrate strategies into their daily routines when we know what that environment is like. We also need families for appointments. I think parents really appreciate having someone with them at times, uh, a sounding board, or, you know, sometimes it's easier to recall information of to uh, listen to it. Or sometimes we're just an extra set hand when there's a baby or another toddler that needs to be careful. These services have really grown. We do offer developmental playgroups. We started a new program just last year called Make the Connection. Uh, this is uh, regarding parent infant bonding. Uh, it was really very successful, so we'll be run out again. Music programming. And the rest of these programs that are listed here are all family literacy programs. These are module-like programs that the Center for Literacy does training, um, so they're very well vetted and researched. The Child yes, Mother Goose program is actually based on the Rhyme the Bind program. It's an American Sign Language. It's one of the popular programs that we offer. We have sign. Um, where we're teaching parents how to read books to the children in language. Uh, we have a literacy and parenting skills uh, program that focuses on parenting skills and literacy library. Just said about transition, um, when I was thinking about this, I thought, well, there's a transition for families, and transition is something that I think is the main front when we're working with families, because we know when things are going to change or when family wants to go to in different directions. So we have ongoing discussions about the needs of their child and when transitions need to occur. Um, I guess it's about how we do that is we explore options. Uh, we really need to keep 
up to date with the processes. I know this year was uh, there was a real change within early childhood intakes. So make sure that we're real knowledgeable on the end. Make sure that families don't have to struggle through those processes. Staff do not prescribe placement. This is families to explore their options and provide as much relevant information as possible to our parents. We're fortunate to have some additional support available to us, and we have done a lot of work in partnering with their uh, survey agencies so we can support the more vulnerable families. Um, health services and process delivery partner for Health for Q. We've been doing that now for about six months, I believe. Um, and that's really looking at improving birth outcomes. It's really um, challenging, but very successful. We're really proud of the fact that we can offer that. We also work quite closely with Tim uh, Alberta. I'm not sure why this is here. We have a lot of work uh, recently with Syrian refugees. We've had a number of uh, little ones who have come in here in but we also had a number of deaf uh, parents who are looking for programming. So we've been working up here in Alberta with um, those, I think there are certain families. And of course, we also work with them for individual support for other individuals. Felt um, quite a good partnership with them. Um, of course, for their families. And we managed to make access for that just a lot. Or for 
more information about our program there's specific calls, you can visit our website. When I thought about the question that Sarah posed, you know, what would improve the province-wide services, I would come at it a little bit differently and try to envision what would be the ideal collective provincial prevention program. Um, and these are kind of the thoughts that I had. Of course, we've talked a little bit about family-centered child-focused programming. I think without this, difficult to meet the needs of a diverse set of families, so we need to keep this in mind. This being collaborative, uh, I think we all work so independently and independently in systems that we really need to communicate effectively and coordinate our services. And this also will maximize our resources, which um, would trick. I think this is more about the parent experience and an indication of our collective work. It seems seamless for parents. That means we're doing a good job. Equitable uh, access. I think families should have equal access to programs and services. At times, our rural people, <laughs> this is a little bit of a stretch for them. Um, but I, it really, I think, should be explored the way to ensure that those comprehensive services can get to the rural areas. Um, all inclusive. I know it's sometimes difficult to reach marginalized and vulnerable populations. I think we continue to strive to have equitable service for them as well. I'm a strong believer in outcomes and evaluation. Um, I think there was an international consensus statement uh, that was forced by Mary Pat Muller and others in 2013. It has 10 best practice principles. I collectively, we should hold ourselves accountable to these principles and evaluate our success as providers based on them. The answer is that information with people and they're interested. So is she talking a little bit about her other these programs or can leave it at that? Can we do you mind if we left it at that? It's approaching four to five. I would like to ask if there were any questions for me for either Bev or for Cheryl. Always either write that down or um, I think on the microphone won't read that. Or indication about questions, but I do um, want to thank you, Cheryl, for that. Um, I Mary Pat Bowler's name has come up a couple of times today, and um, I've actually asked if we could invite her for one of the WebExes and received a head nod. Um, and I also really appreciated your comments about the seamless for parents. And this is something we, I think, as a community really need to strive for. We have many parents struggling with um, the diagnosis of trying to find, not services, but feeling like they're, um, they're um, I don't know the term. They seem to uh, struggle with whipping into a pattern of service. And I guess I'm talking from the perspective in rural Alberta, not in Edmonton and the um, Bend communities, and probably not around Calgary as well. But um, I said that's something we need to strive for to keep those parents in mind when we're designing. Uh, intervention systems and not make the system rule the parents, make the parents um, part of that system. Um, and I, I want to thank everybody for joining us. If you could, uh, I'm going to say one more thing. If you could send me the 10 practice principles, 
I think I've seen them, but I would uh, share them with, with the group uh, in my next October uh, email. I think that would be great. Do you have a question? So the PowerPoints to be shared, would that be okay with everyone? Yeah. That I'm going to assume maybe, yes. I hear you. Okay. Yes, that's great. Yeah, I'll send it okay. to you. And I'll, I'll send them out to the... Um, I'm trying to get used to these new letters that we are. Um, group. Okay. So got it wrong. PLC. Oh, PLC. Professional Learning Community. Such a world of acronyms I'm finding. And I'm not an acronym person. So um, I appreciate all of you coming today and taking the time. And I, I found this very useful. I have at least four pages of notes for myself. Um, we'll Hopefully, in October in Calgary or in November, Edmonton. So, um, have a good month, you guys. Take care. Thanks. Oh, we